watching the Live Aid concert, right next to this guy. Oh. <laughs> what was it like, what, like, you like, I have to go in and watch this, the last part of the movie. What's it like for you to watch this? I, I, I was in New York having dinner just yesterday, and uh, I, I wanted to, for some reason, get up and just go see it with the Thanksgiving crowd. Oh, no. I just can't get over it. It's wow. you know, something that, it's a once in a lifetime opportunity, obviously, but uh, I've become a fan now. <laughs> and it's, uh, it's something I'm incredibly proud of, but I just want to, I, I love being a part of feel, feeling like uh, just a community of people rejoicing and, and loving him and loving the band. It, it's, uh, it's a really special thing for me now. You know, uh, I, yeah, I wanted to, I snuck mm. in for the last few minutes, and I think I'll do that first, as long as I think it's the theater. <laughs> I, I, I told him, I said, this is the third time I've seen the movie. He goes, that's it. <laughs> no, I feel like a lunatic, because I've watched it in all the iterations, and uh, and still, I, mean, I, just, I just watched the entire Live Aid here at Fox, mm. that's a, it's a little bit of a truncated version, and mm. I just don't ever want it to go away, so yeah. I'm, I'm sneaking in everywhere I can. <laughs> Is it uh, like an out-of-body experience when you're watching just the, how consumed, how, how, how lost you get in the role? You know, it just it brings me back to... Uh, to a certain place and time, and I think that's exactly what Live Aid does for for so many people, and and what Queen does as a whole. It just it takes me instantly back to, to those days, trying to figure it all out. Especially Live Aid, because Live Aid was the first thing we shot, and to be out there in the middle of nowhere in a in a field that airstrip we shot it at, and I remember just standing there in, in, in a I was very cold just trying to absorb all of this and think, wow, I'm, what an opportunity and uh, what an honor it is. Just don't, don't mess this up. <laughs> so, so instead of like building up, easing into the role and, and building to that climax, that was the first thing you shot. Yeah. How do you talk about that visit by fire? That's exactly what it was. And you know, inevitably, it, it helped so much because I mean, not only did it keep me on, on my toes, uh, but the entire it, it galvanized us as, as a band and as a group of actors. And immediately, you know, Aaron Hare, our production designer, had to get up one of uh, the, the most I think difficult sets to put together. Uh, not only was it the the actual stage was attached to the backstage, so there's. There's everybody clamoring to do so many things, and uh, you know, but my makeup artist Jan Sewell, not realizing uh, until maybe a couple months earlier that that's what we were doing in the beginning, and so to just try to orchestrate all of the looks from uh, from everyone's standpoint, from makeup and costume design, and of course, you know, production design and, and art direction, everybody just just came in and. I uh, thought, let's get through the hardest part first, and we'll move on from there. And I think it just raised everybody's game. Do you think that, that starting starting at that point gave you a, like an idea to, like, okay, that's what I'm going to build to throughout this movie as you're, you're showing Freddie and, and Queen like come together and evolve and their music evolve, you know, Freddie's look evolve. And you, you talked about the makeup, and I want to ask you about that. Uh, but uh, first, I want to ask you: Grand King have been championing this movie for for more than ten years. 
And as every producer knows, you know, sometimes like you hear 10 years and you go, really, that's all? Um, because it takes so long to get a movie made. But tell me about the, the first conversations you had with him uh, and just maybe how, uh, you, you know, how daunting it might have been for you to play this guy. Yeah. Well, uh, I, was, I was working on, uh, in New York, on uh, this show called Mr. Robot, and I played this computer hacker who's she's just a, a very uh, profoundly alienated young man who has a very hard time with uh, dealing with social settings and, and human beings uh, in, in any capacity. So to, to go from that and have someone see that and say, because uh, I saw you in Mr. Robot, <laughs> it's a, uh, a man who could command an audience like no one else in the world. So it was kind of shocking. I was like, well, when, when's the rug going to be pulled out from under my legs? But it didn't happen. I walked out of this five hour meeting and I was almost convinced that I was the guy that was going to play Freddie Mercury. And uh, I just I was shocked. And I, I remember walking. I didn't even go straight to my house. I went to my mom's, and my I knew my brother was there. And I just needed to kind of go over this and kind of uh, just confirm it in some way. Because I had the DVDs that they gave me in my hand. I had all the music. I had all the books, and I just still couldn't believe it. And uh, the next day, I woke up and I said, "It's, it's time to get to work." And uh, went from there I just thought just give it everything you have you have quite a bit of time I mean you have to finish Mr. Robot and there's another project I was working on but I knew I could go to bed every night and just work on this and I did where did you start to work on it did it start with with the singing did it start with just like delving into research and, and how deep did you go in to really uh, to, to find out as much as you could about Freddie before you got into the physical part of playing? Well, I, I just immediately put everything on. I could find anything you could find on YouTube, all the archival footage. I mean, if someone had a camcorded video from Paris in 1977, mm -hmm. I would just, I found it. And I watched it and I recorded everything. And uh, I just went back to it every single night. And, you know, when he's singing, I noticed sometimes how he would just let loose and his teeth would be there. And I said, okay, those teeth, I have to find a way to, to work with those because we're, we're going to use a prosthetic, I'm sure. So I asked Graham, I said, the first thing I need to work with so I can not only just emulate him vocally in his daily life, but to, to sing as Freddie Mercury, I had to get used to that. So that was one of the first things I asked him for immediately. I asked him for a dialect coach because... You know, Freddie's mom, when she talks, I would watch her, she has a Gujarati, this Indian accent, and he seems to kind of overcompensate for that with this real, you know, royal British dialect, and sometimes the, it, that Indian accent comes out, so I worked on that forever, and, uh, and then, you know, in true Hollywood form, I, I kind of didn't exactly have the part. They had to shop it to studios. Thank you, Fox. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Fox. Thank you, Fox, uh, for being the ones that pulled the trigger on this. But, you know, Graham said, we, well, we have to shop this around. We, they actually, people need to see you do this because uh, they don't know that Mr. Robot can play Freddie Mercury. And I said, Neither do I. <laughs> <laughs> so I went, I went to London and I put myself, uh, well, they got me a great sound engineer and, and um, I mean, the sound team on this was incredible. John Warhurst and Becky Bentham and Paul Massey and, uh, you know, so many other people involved. I went, to, I went to Abbey Road and they funded a bit of that, Fox did. And uh, I put four songs on tape, some singing myself, some singing with, as Freddie, with Freddie's voice uh, taking over. And I did um, an uh, impromptu Q&A where I was just asked questions as Freddie Mercury by Anthony McCartan, a writer, and mm -hmm. Dennis O'Sullivan, one of our producers. They just started throwing out questions to me at random. And I said, what the hell? I mean, you got to answer them at some point. <laughs> so I did. How long before 
principal, how, how long before the, you started filming, I mean, basically with the live aid scene, did you start to wear the teeth so you could get used to it, so you really get the, not just the hang of it, but the, you know, get the, the look and feel of well, Freddy? I had that meeting with Graham on season two of Mr. Robot. Mm -hmm. Then I did that audition at uh, Abbey Road. Then I went to shoot the third season with Mr. Robot. Wow. And there would be nights where I would go from Elliot Alderson and put <laughs> Freddie's teeth in and attempt to be Freddie Mercury. And it was a very, very confusing time. <laughs> what did you do with the teeth when you were done filming? I kept them. And I got so used to them and I, I loved them. At first I thought, really, these, these teeth I'm going to have to wear throughout? And believe it or not, they were even bigger than they are in, in what you see in the film. I, his actual teeth are larger than that. What we realized is his head is actually just bigger than mine. So oh my God. we had to size them down. But at the very end, I fell in love with those teeth and fell in love with everything about him. Mm. It's the, just the most gorgeous human being uh, mm. uh, I've ever in, encountered. And... Uh, in, in true Freddie Mercury fashion, I had them cast in gold. Aww. So I had a Freddie Mercury grill. <laughs> and I'll donate that to charity one day. He's, he's, I mean, he's affected my life. I grew up with AIDS as, as well in, in the 80s, and I knew exactly what that was and how devastating it was. Maybe not as much to the degree as, as a generation elder than me, but uh, it, it hit so much harder after this film. And one cool thing I got to do was I reached out to, to Bono and, uh, mm -hmm. and Red, because I remember growing up how prolific Red was. Uh, and. I got to go to Africa recently, which was really cool. I got to see all the work that Red had done over there and just just see one, I mean, that obviously it's still a, it's still this pandemic in Africa, which is, is crazy to think about. If, if these people don't take their pill every day, you know, there'll be a resurgence of this horrific disease. And to see, you know, what, you know, what the effect has been is beyond profound. So, uh, I mean, it's, it's, this film has been just, a, it's been a gift, it's been unsettling in so many ways, but yeah, he's, he's, uh, he's had a, a really, really, really strong effect on me. Certainly. You know, the, uh, the, in the preparation to humanize such a larger-than-life legend to demystify him yeah. and to capture the humanity of him and just make him a, a real person. Uh, like, how did you work with everyone to crack that? To like, okay, this is the story that we're going to tell. That's going to debunk the, the the legend and really just show him as a vulnerable artist. Yeah, that's a great question. And uh, yes. thank you. Uh, it was difficult because he is, he's not, when I looked at him, I said, oh man, he is not human. This guy is, he is from another planet, and thus his name in a number of ways. But I, uh, I looked at him and I said, how the hell am I gonna be able to do that? And ultimately I, I saw a guy who could hold an entire audience of thousands in his hand but ultimately he just wanted someone to hold him in their hand. And it took me a bit to realize, but uh, I thought, you know, what an artist. And, and that's something I could connect to is we go out there and we all in our separate ways can put ourselves out there. And outside of ourselves, we extend ourselves to do greater things than we think we're capable of. And sometimes, you know, we just want someone to put our, their arm around us and, and Tell, him, tell us that, that we're all right. Yeah. And in a way, he found a way to do that with his audience, which I, I think is just magical. He gets out there and he sings We Are the Champions, and he really does look everybody in the eye somehow, makes you feel like you're just, you're okay being who you are, and you're part of something pretty great. 
it's a, this universally beautiful thing that he allows us to do and it's just to be incredibly authentic in ourselves and say hey it's not just okay to be yourself it's really great look around we're all just going to be ourselves here while we sing this song and maybe we'll take that a little bit further when we leave but it's pretty great right now mm -hmm. watching the film <laughs> When I saw the movie for the first time here, uh, you know, as a Q and did with I think it was John Horn, um, and I was so like just like blown away. And you know, watching the movie a second time, I was able to really like uh, sort of uh, just get into it a little more. And I just was really struck by how natural and organic his movements were on yeah. stage. How did you? And if you had a movement coach, yeah, uh, tell me about working with her. You got it. Well, I, uh, I've had so many auditions as an actor, and a lot of them have not gone well. So I had the opportunity to actually audition choreographers, and it, I only sat down with a few and some great ones, but I, I realized almost instantly with the language we were talking about that choreography wasn't going to work. And, I wanted to understand why he was so elegant at times, why he was so powerful, why he had the, the very unique uh, movement and articulation that he does. And this young lady named Holly Bennett sat down, and I could tell almost instantly we just had this, uh, we had this ability to talk to each other like uh, I hadn't had previously. And we just a quick shorthand and. We talked about it being spontaneous and everything, wanting everything to be spontaneous and not rehearsed. And I could hear Freddie almost echo with everything I listened to as nothing, nothing should be rehearsed. If it's rehearsed, then it's cool. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and so I, I thought, you know what? Let's take a chance on Pauline Bennett. She didn't have a, a ton of credit under her belt, but I could just, I felt something really special going on there. And, you know, it wasn't intimidating going in with some big shot choreographer. I thought, hey, this is good. We can each grow together and make this something that is our own. So some days we would just, we would go into a dance studio and she would try to teach me a little bit of ballet because he was so elegant. She would, we would some days we would watch cabaret and she'd show me some Bob Fosse movements. Some days she would take me out of the element and she, we would go over to this, this park called Regent's Park in London and, and we would just uh, move as Freddie in front of people, which is a pretty terrifying thing. <laughs> <laughs> just starting to figure it out. Um, but, you know, there were times we would just sit in this big dance studio and watch him in an interview. And, uh, and at times he would, you'd see him as he used a cigarette to cover his mouth or a, or a glass to kind of you know, filled with alcohol to shield himself from a reporter. When he would open up, what he would do, and how he, he covered his lips. And at times she, she would talk to me and she'd say, all right, now pull that head back and do that yoga move when you're on stage. Pull your head all the way back. Mm -hmm. I'd be like, wow, he's really cranking his head back. And she, she'd say, why? And I'd say, I don't know, just sing louder. And be like, no, you know, maybe, he, maybe he's just trying to hide his teeth in that moment. And you realize, you know, she, that may be right. Whether it was or not, it got me to do it, she told me. <laughs> Sometimes she'd, she'd go out there and she'd go, give me your bullfighting stance. And I'd do the bullfighting stance. She'd go, show me Freddie's bullfighting stance. And all of a sudden, I would just own this thing. Um, and she got, she got, we had a good, good vocabulary of, of how to talk uh, about Freddie's movements and the evolution of those movements. Sometimes she, she would have me do a 1970s Freddy, which was different from a, a 80s Freddy, and she'd say, you know the words to Killer Queen? I'd say, yeah. She'd say, all right, give me the soliloquy of Killer Queen performed by Marie Antoinette. And all of a sudden, I'd be, I'd be this. And then later on, she'd be like, all right, now give me, give me the radio gaga fist. And I'd throw that out there in this macho way. And she'd be like, where does the fist come from? And I'd say, boxing. He was a boxer as a kid. And how do you think he sustains himself running across stage all day long? Well, he, he was a long distance marathon runner as a kid. So all these things we'd start to eventually go back to his childhood and watch his mom and listen to his mom, look at his dad, 
It just, uh, it became kind of, what are you watching now? What are we looking at now? And every night it was fascinating to go and try to learn something about Freddie that I did not know before. And we challenged each other. You know, so, so you, obviously you shot out a sequence. And like I said, you know, the movie like just builds up, you know, and, and Freddie's, Freddie, his movements evolve, his confidence evolves. Um, so how did you, what was the biggest challenge to shoot out a sequence, but still, you know, have this like upward sloping arc to his character make, make it feel so seamless? Like how did you like, well, one thing I love, I love every aspect of being, uh, getting to do what I so fortunately am privileged to do. Uh, I love, I love costume fittings. <laughs> I love sitting in makeup. I, I just, I'm fascinated by all of it. And I'm fascinated by cinematography and production design as well, all of it. And Tom Siegel, we have this brilliant, brilliant cinematographer who uh, in the very early years of Queenie, he decided we were gonna shoot a lot of it uh, on handheld uh, cameras. We were gonna pick them up, put them over the shoulder, and it would be a little bit rickety. It wouldn't be as, uh, as polished as it, it turned out to be later on. And, and you see the evolution of that through the shots in the film. So towards the end, everything feels more polished, more structured, more elegant, and uh, it's, it's kind of more a touch and go early on. So that was one way, and then sure. we kind of did that with everything. Early on in, in the choreography, uh, the stuff I did with the first concert uh, of Smile was, you know, it was just things that I did on the day over and over, and I tried to make them outlandish, and as outlandish and foolish as I could. Um, and even Freddie, it was a sh it's a shame because even when he was young, he was still polished. So <laughs> it's kind of a disservice not to be as perfect as he was, but you do have to show some evolution. And he, he found a way to be more conservative in his movements and more powerful. And you know, you realize as, as he gets older, he, he knows that there's an audience of thousands watching and he stands in a position where you can see him no matter where you're sitting or where you're standing or what your eye line is. He will make sure you get a good show. Uh, I grew up in Philadelphia and was at Live Aid in Philly when we were watching the simulcast on the big screens of, of Queen. So here I am, like watching Philadelphia live, and all we talked about after the concert was what we saw on the big screen of Queen and Freddie Mercury. So that's a testament to to what you just talked, what you just said. Um, but but the the movements, the you know, working with Polly, like how did they you and Polly work with like wardrobe and hair and makeup to make it all like yeah. you know, come together like that? Well, what I quickly learned from Polly was that this was a guy who wanted to create a spectacle as well. So mm -hmm. I'd go into wardrobe and it wouldn't just be me and Julian Day talking about, Julian Day and I talking about how to, what, what would be the most audacious look for Freddie? It would, it would be what is going to move well on stage? What will be the most flattering? What, you know, I mean, what serves us while we're filming to catch the light, to catch the flow, to make things as, as, as much of a spectacle and as entertaining as possible? So nothing would be for the sake of making uh, a show, maybe the, the Jimi Hendrix wizard jacket. Mm. <laughs> that, one, that did belong to Jimi Hendrix, by the way. Oh, wow. That's the name of the wizard jacket. Um, <laughs> but it was, it was things like that, where I, I would make sure to go into Jansul and keep the hair and makeup on while we were testing it before going into the costume fittings with Julian. And I just looked at it as, as rehearsal. I mean, Freddie would have been in hundreds of costume fittings. And I just, uh, you know, I, I really relished it after a while. I was like, yeah, let's try this on. Let's try that on. Get me a cup of tea while you're at it. <laughs> <laughs> and things of that nature. Filming the, the concert scenes, like how, how far into the crowd did the actual people go before it became visual effects? Because unless you filled the whole stadium with like 100,000 people, 
Uh, maybe you did. I don't know. That's my question. How did you fill that scene? Um, you know? I don't want to take away from no, that. Don't, don't. <laughs> but we had great vis visual effects supervisors on this. Uh, it is a testament because you really do feel like there are hundreds of thousands of people out there in every sequence. And we had quite a lot, but never that many, of course. <laughs> never that many. And uh, yeah, it's a testament to their work. What, what was accomplished out there. I, mean, I did see Live Aid brought the other day and it took me back. I, you just, you get a sense of how much that audience impacts uh, the entire storytelling. I mean, it was bigger than like, you know, Woodstock. <laughs> I mean, it was crazy. But uh, um, the first time Queen and the first time family saw the movie, the first time they saw the finished finished film? Like, what was that like for them, or what was that like for you? Wow. Uh, you know, it was it was a gift having having Brian May there as often as he was, and Roger Taylor uh, um, and chiming in, and they could have easily been uh, polarizing and, and meticulous about what we were getting wrong. And the fact of the matter is, they were they were just so enthusiastic about us telling their story and uh, you know they came in often during the uh, the concert performances especially Brian May and I, I really couldn't have done it without him uh, mm -hmm. he really he really had he had me under his wing and I, I really felt like I excelled when he was there mm -hmm. um, I, th I did my best work when Brian was there and you know sometimes a producer would, would be like all right, you want to make sure you feel free enough to do your job, especially Bull and Lee, who was playing Brian May. I, you can imagine how hard that would have been for him. Not a lot of Ben Hardy playing Roger Taylor. But as far as I was concerned, I wanted him there as often as possible. It felt like that the spirit of the band was there as well. I mean, sometimes it would be surreal. But I would stay in character a lot during shooting. One, because it's... Well, it's just really fun being Freddie Mercury. <laughs> <laughs> but then, you know, to talk Freddie Mercury at that age, to talk to an older Brian May was the most surreal thing. <laughs> yeah. Especially him. I think sometimes he would look at me and I, you know, I couldn't tell if he wanted me to stop or keep going. <laughs> it's something I'll never forget. Did you take a picture, like, in costume as Freddie with, with the other real guys and just, like, you know, I didn't, because I, you know, I didn't want to sully any of what it was, you know, it, it, for me, I, there's only one Freddie Mercury, yeah. mm -hmm. and I just got, I got the gift of perhaps telling a part of his story, you know, for us to relive in a way, and a new generation to, to go back and discover him, I mean, I'll, uh, I'll be, you know, dead and gone, but the, the Freddie Mercury and Queen will last and live on forever. One more question before I just uh, take a few from the audience. Uh, Freddie's sister, Solomon. Yeah, I didn't even answer your question. Yeah. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. They, uh, you know, I was, where I don't remember where, I was here and uh, Graham King was showing the band and I think the way he says it, he didn't even watch the movie, he just watched them the entire time. I think they were very, they were very moved by it. They were very, very moved by it. Um, at one point, I remember Roger Taylor thinking that, uh, possibly thinking that, that Brian's uh, voice had been dubbed by Brian himself. That's how well Bill got it down. But uh, we got great compliments for them and I, from them, and I was over the moon because. And you can imagine how, how it might feel. At one point, um, Anita, Brian's wife, came on set when we were shooting We Will Rock You, and she saw Glow in, uh, as the younger Brian May, and you could just see her travel back in time. Wow. Yeah, it was, mm -hmm. it was, yeah, it brought her, it moved her, it moved all of us. It was, mm -hmm. it was unreal. We got to, we got to screen this movie in London, and not screen, we premiered it at Wembley Arena, wow. which is not Wembley oh. Stadium, but it's pretty massive. And there were about 6,500 audience members. Wow. And uh, I was sitting there with the cast as the movie was about to start. And I just, uh, for a second, went. 
<laughs> and just that quietly, and within seconds, the entire crowd <laughs> over. And I, I looked at Brian May and I saw him smile. And, and it doesn't get better than that. But then the film ends, and uh, uh, I got to see Cash, Cash Mira, afterwards, and we sat and talked for I mean, almost the majority of. The, the party afterwards, I sat with Freddie Mercury's sister and wow. talked about Freddie and talked about us going to tea and, and dinners. And so I get, get to go in a couple of weeks and go hang out with Freddie's sister. Aww. That is unreal. That is too much. Okay. That is definitely unreal. <laughs> uh, who's got a question? Right there, look at us. No, I learned, uh, yeah, I went through, it was like, I've gone to acting school, and this was like, I was, I was having acting school nightmares. <laughs> uh, I had to learn the piano, I've never played piano. Um, not only that, I mean, with all the things you can do, I, I don't sing, I had to take singing lessons. Um, and it was really tough at first, because I'm just not a singer, but eventually, I think if you work hard enough on something, uh, you tend to, you start to believe that you can do it. I never thought I'd be able to do Live Aid, and you know, there were times with Polly where I was just like thrown in the towel, and I'd get back up, and I worked it out. So countless hours of piano lessons and singing lessons, uh, obviously the movement. I remember reading the script for the first time and thinking, oh my God, how am I gonna do this? And getting to page 19 and then 20, and the stage direction said, Freddie Mercury plays the piano upside down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there were nights when I would you know, be up till two o'clock in the morning sitting with the piano, <laughs> trying to work it out. And uh, eventually I did. Wow. So it was really yes. cool that day when I did it. Was <laughs> Yes, you, next to left. Great, I mean, amazing. Thank you. Did you ever get to meet with uh, the real Jimmy and the real Molly? <clears throat> Sadly, uh, Jim has passed away. Um, he wrote a book, I got to read his book, and uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's difficult at times, because I, I want to reread everything now. I mean, mm -hmm. and he just had such an impact, but uh, I wish that would, were the case. I, I got to meet a lot of people, and I wish those, those two were um, ones that I could have talked to. Um, Mary is extremely private. That was obviously the love of her life as well, and she's quite guarded about their, their relationship and, and him as a whole. She, she read the script and she signed off on the script, which I think was huge for her to do. Because, uh, you know, I can only imagine that she knows this man in one very, very specific way, and he means the world to her. And of course, she, yeah, I can't even speak on her behalf. No, you know, it's difficult. I just appreciate her so much. I mean, she is, she's the only person who knows where his ashes are scattered. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. And he, uh, yeah, those were the two loves of his life, so uh, I would have loved to have reached out, but unfortunately I wasn't able to. Mm -hmm. I just, I hope if she ever does watch it, which she, she will, uh, that, that I, we did him some justice. And I did. Well, considering that the film has made more than $150 million domestically. <laughs> Wait for it, and almost 500 million worldwide. I don't know. It's not. It's not a money thing. Right. Yeah. Sure. But people. Why, why do you come to see it? Why do you think people have just embraced? I've I've got to travel with this film, promoting it every in every city, not every city, but all across the globe, and. I, I have to say one very special moment happened just a couple of weeks ago. We were in Japan and I've had, I've had a couple of opportunities to surprise a few audiences here in LA. 
It took them a while before uh, the movie started that they realized, oh, that's the guy that's about to play Freddie Mercury. <laughs> <laughs> Birmingham is touch and go, but we went to Japan. We went to Tokyo where Freddie and Queen played 50 times wow. all over Japan. And uh, the Japanese were some of the first people to embrace Queen and Freddie Mercury. Um, well, they had a, they had a sing along version of the film, oh. and uh, oh. yeah, at the end, the, everybody had glow sticks and they're singing to every song oh. in the line. Oh. And you go up to the audience, and uh, so I, I said, you know what? Let's ask some questions, and for the. The vast majority, I know, understood English, but I needed someone to interpret their questions. But they could sing every word to We Are The Champions. <laughs> and they knew exactly what those songs meant. And uh, it, it got us all emotional, but Willem is gonna probably, no, he won't care. I mean, he, I, I've never seen him quite so emotional. He, Willem Lee plays Brian May. He had to, to leave the theater at one point because mm. he was so overwhelmed. Um, Queen, uh, it's music that you instantly understand and it hits you at your heart. And, and somewhere deep inside, it just goes even further. And it, it does something kind of subversely where you know it's having an impact on you for reasons that are just underneath the surface. And they always are, but as much as they get you emotional, they, they get you riled up, they empower you, they make you feel united and strong. Um, you know, I think about Freddie, uh, and we were talking about demystifying him, and it, it's difficult, because he, he's been a god to me, but, you know, I looked at this guy who was, God, he was shipped all over the world as a kid, on a boat, I mean, the guy was on a boat as a kid, from. Zanzibar to India without any family to told, hey, you're gonna go to school in this foreign land and you have to learn English. And then when you come home on a boat again, your country's gonna be in a revolution. And you know what? The whole family's gonna move to England and you'll be 18 and you're gonna have to figure that out. Uh, and your name's Farouk Bulsara and you have a pretty big set of teeth. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, you're also, going to try to have to deal with figuring out your, your sexual identity uh, at a time when anything other than being heterosexual was stigmatized, still is. Um, so just here, we'll throw everything at you, man. And what it was for Freddie, I think is, or at least what helped me understand him is, you know, here's this, this immigrant who's very conflicted and confused and you know, has a name that people struggle with and a look that people struggle with and a sexual identity that he can't really share with anyone. But he's got something burning inside. He's got something that is about to explode like a fireball. He's gonna get out there on stage and whatever has been brewing inside of him is gonna burst out. Mm -hmm. And he's gonna share it in the most confident, brilliant, bold, profound, poignant, look you in the eye and say, it's okay, I'm okay, we're okay. Wow, look at me, and look at you. This is glorious. And that's how I understand Queen. Oh. Um, this is glorious. So, so, you know, Bohemian Rhapsody is in theaters now. Uh, you see the film, you love the movie. Tweet. So how do you spread the word? How do you spread the love? Well, you know, social media. That's where people review movies these days. So so make sure you go on Facebook, you go on Instagram, go on Twitter. Uh, if you're still using MySpace, <laughs> whatever, whatever folks are both, please spread the word to see Bohemian Rhapsody. And ladies and gentlemen, Woo! Right there.